Welcome to this video on the superposition principle. In previous videos, we've looked at some DC theorems, such as the potential divider rule and the current divider rule. We've looked at resistors in series and parallel, but all the examples that we've looked at so far have only involved one power source. Now, in this example, we have two cells in this circuit, um, and I've marked them V1 and V2. And you'll notice that having two cells in this circuit is going to give us two sources of power. And that makes things a little bit more difficult for us. One of the things we can do to solve a question like this is to use the superposition principle. And in this example, we'll go through how we can apply the superposition principle to solve a circuit like this. In this case, what I want to do is I want to work out the current in each of these three resistors, R1, R2 and R3. And I also want to calculate the power that I dissipate in each of these resistors, R1, R2, and R3 as well. The superposition principle basically involves making things simpler for ourselves. And the way we can do this is by dealing with this problem one half at a time. Let's have a look. So what I've done here is I've redrawn the same circuit twice. But you'll notice that on the left-hand side, I've left one power supply in but I've removed the other one. I've replaced it with just a wire or a short circuit, which I've denoted by that notation there. On the right hand side, I've done the opposite. I've kept the circuit exactly as it is, but I've retained the other power supply, V2, and V1 has just been replaced by a short circuit. And what I'm gonna do is use the potential divider rule, one of the rules we've covered previously, to work out the voltages across these resistors, and in turn, then work out the currents and power dissipated in each of these resistors. We'll deal with each half separately, but then we'll look to combine our answers further down the line or superimpose them on one another, which is where the title comes from. So let's look at the left hand side first of all, because if we look at this circuit, we can simplify it further. If you look at the current path starting at the supply, Currents flowing through this circuit through R1 and it gets to a, a junction here where some of that current will flow through R2 and some of that current will flow through R3 and then rejoin again to return back to the supply. And so I can think of this as one resistor followed by two resistors in parallel. In fact, I could redraw this circuit to look something like this. I could have my cell leading to one resistor which then splits into two resistors, R2 and R3, and then back to the supply again. The reason I want to consider things like this is because we can use this or apply this to make this circuit even simpler because what I can do is I can look at these two resistors here in parallel and we can combine them into just one resistance. So let's do that because what I can say is that R2 in parallel with R3, I'll denote like this, R2 double slash 3, that's just my shorthand for parallel, is going to be R2 in parallel with R3, and in this case, R2 is a 10 ohm resistor, so that's 10 in parallel with R3, which is 20. Now that double slash again is just my shorthand, but in a previous video we've looked at how we can combine resistors in parallel. If you're not sure how to do that, I suggest going back to that video. But 10 in parallel with 20 gives us an answer of 6.67 ohms. And so what I can now say is this is the same as saying R1, which was our first resistor, followed by R2 slash 3. So I'll mark those on here, R1 and R2 slash 3. And R1, we said, was 30 ohms. And R2 slash 3, we've just calculated to be 6.67 ohms. We'll come back to this in just a second, but I want to repeat this process on the right-hand side. But on the right-hand side, we have to be careful. Um, starting at the supply, our current flows um, through R3, first of all. So through, through a 20 ohm resistor. We reach this point here where we split, and we'll find that R1 and R2 are in parallel. So again, if I was to redraw that circuit, just as a quick sketch here, we'd have something like this. We'd have um, 
our cell, which takes us to R3. Then we split into R1 and R2. Okay, so R3, I'll mark on like so, R1 and R2. And I'll mark those values on there as well because we said that R3 was 20, R1 was 30, and R2 was 10. But what we can do again on this side is simplify uh, these two resistors by again using our... Um, parallel resistor equation and this time I'll call it R1 slash 2 and R1 slash 2, R1 in parallel with R2 is going to be 30 in parallel with 10 and that gives me an answer of 7.5 ohms so again I can redraw this circuit as just being two resistances now we can have R3, which we said was 20 ohms. And we can also say R1 slash 2, which we've just calculated as being 7.5 ohms. So how does this help us? Well, because we've simplified our circuit down to two series resistances in each case, we can use the potential divider rule because we have one power supply. On the left-hand side, that's the 40-volt power supply. And on the right-hand side, the 50-volt. And in each case, we have two resistances in series connected to that supply. And so what I can do is I can calculate the voltage across R1, which I'll call V1, and the voltage across both resistors 2 and 3, because remember they're both combined together in parallel. And I'll call that V2 slash 3. On the right hand side, I'm calculating V1 slash 2, the voltage across resistor 1 and 2. And the voltage across R3, which I'll call V3. One thing to point out at this point is it's important to be consistent. You'll notice on both sides I'm referring to the same resistors as R1, R2 and R3. In each case they're consistently named. It's important to be consistent because at the end of the superposition principle we're going to bring both of our sets of answers back together again or superimpose them together. And we can only do that correctly if we've named everything consistently in both cases. So let's apply our potential divider rule here, because we know that to calculate V1 in this case on the, on the left hand side, we have to say that V1 is equal to the supply voltage, which in this case is 40, multiplied by a fraction. And on the top of that fraction, we put whichever resistor we're measuring across. So in this case, V1 is measured across R1. So I'm going to put R1 on the top of the fraction, so that's 30. And on the bottom of the fraction, both resistors added together. So that's 30 plus 6.67. And this gives me an answer of 32.72 volts. If you're not sure about the potential divider rule, I suggest going back to the video where we covered potential dividers. But now that we know that V1 is 32.72 volts, we know Kirchhoff's voltage law tells us that the supply is equal to the sum of the voltages dropped, or the total of the voltages dropped. So very simply, if I know that 32.72 volts of the 40 volt supply is dropped across V1, then whatever remains must be V2 slash 3. So we can say that V2 slash 3 is equal to 40 minus 32.72 which in this case is 7.28 volts. Let's do the same on the right hand side and work out V3. So V3 
is measured across a 20 ohm resistor in series with a 7.5 ohm resistor. And so when we set up our potential divider rule, we'll apply the same method. We'll say that V3 is equal to the supply voltage, 50 in this case, multiplied by a fraction. On the top of that fraction, I'm measuring across the 20 ohm resistor, so 20 goes on the top, 20 plus 7.5 on the bottom. And that gives me an answer of 36.36 volts. And again, I can work out V1 slash 2 by subtracting 50 minus 36.36. And whatever remains must be V1 slash 2, 13.64 in this case, 13.64 volts. So now that we've calculated all the voltages in our circuits, it's important to realize that the parallel voltages we've calculated, V2 slash 3 or V1 slash 2, actually apply to both of those resistors separately. Parallel resistors share the same voltage. And so on the left-hand side, we can say that V2 is 7.28 volts and V3 is 7.28 volts. They'll both share the same voltage. And likewise, on the right-hand side, V1 is 13.64 and V2 is 13.64. So we actually now know the voltages across each resistor. But remember, we've split our page down the middle here and come up with two separate circuits. We need to combine these results together to get back to our original circuit where we started. To do that, I'm going to mark these voltages onto our diagrams. And the way we do that is by marking voltages against the flow of the direction of current, just with an arrow. So what I mean by that is V1 is going to be marked against R1 here. And we know that on the left-hand side here, the current is going to flow through R1 in this direction to the right here. So we mark on our voltage against that direction, or in the opposite direction. Our voltage is going to be marked on in this direction here. And I'll mark that on as a value of 32.72 volts. Likewise, for V2, I can say it's going to be in this direction. And we can mark that on as 7.28. And it's the same for V3, 7.28. On the right-hand side, we're going to do the same thing. So V1 is this time going to point in this direction uh, against the flow of current and V1 is 13.64 V2 is 13.64 as well and V3 is 36.36 .36. So the final step is to superimpose these two sets of values back onto the same diagram here. And you can see that I've taken V1, V2 and V3 from both the left and the right hand side of our previous working and put them onto the same diagram here. And this is the last stage of the superposition principle. So what we can say is looking first of all at R1, these two voltages are in opposite directions to one another. In R2, the two voltages are in the same direction as one another. And then in R3, they're in the opposite again. And so when voltages are in the opposite direction to one another, in the case of R1 and R3, we have to subtract them from one another to get the total voltage. And then in the case of R2, where the voltages are in the same direction, we have to add those two voltages together. And so I get three total voltages. A total V1, which in this case is 19.08 volts. A total V2, which is 20.92 volts. And finally, a total V3, which is 29.08 volts. We said at the beginning that the 
aim of this question was to work out the currents and the powers dissipated in each of these three resistors. And so finally, we can use Ohm's law, first of all, and then our formula for power to work out these currents and powers because we now know the voltages. So we know that current is voltage divided by resistance. And so we have three voltages and three resistances. So very simply, we can say that I1, the current in our resistor R1, is going to be equal to 19.08 divided by 30, the resistance in that case. Likewise, I can say that I2 is going to be 20.92 divided by 10, the resistance of R2. And then finally, I3 is going to be 29.08 divided by 20, the resistance of R3. And for these, I get answers of 0 0.64 amps, 2.09 amps, and 1.45 amps. For the last section, we said that we were going to calculate the power dissipated in each of these three resistors. And so I can calculate P1, P2, and P3, the power dissipated in each of those three resistors. And we know that the formula for power is voltage times current. And so very simply, P1 would be 19.08 multiplied by 0 0.64. P2 would be 20.92 times 2.09. And P3 would be 29.08 multiplied by 1.45. And so for each of those, I get answers of 12.21 watts, 43.72 watts, and finally, 42.17 watts. So I hope you found this video useful. First of all, on how we can use the superposition principle to break down and simplify more complicated circuits that have more than one power supply. And then, how we can use the voltages that we gather to calculate currents and powers dissipated in resistors in a simple DC network.